November is Native American Heritage Month and of course a holiday that many celebrate as Thanksgiving. All week we take a look at people and places across Turtle Island. This is a special edition of the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. I am Aliyah Chavez and we thank you for joining us for this special edition of the ICT Newscast. Today we are featuring art and music. We start in the plains where ledger art has become a popular style across various tribes. John Isaiah Pepion from the Blackfeet Nation shared the history and significance behind the art form with ICT's Paris Wise. One of the first starts of ledger art was in the 1800s, when the government started forcing um, assimilation policies on the indigenous peoples of America and Canada and started um, um, putting us on reservations and, and, and start locking us up for living the life that we live, say, as hunting buffalo, going on raids, or just protecting our people and feeding our people. And they wanted us to farm and stay on reservations, so they start sending... Um, uh, they start sending warriors and 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 women to to penitentiaries and one uh, one penitentiary after an old Spanish fort in Florida was called Saint Augustine, Florida, which is still exists today. They were sent there. Um, started out with um, more more Southern Plains warriors like uh, Sh Southern Cheyenne and like um, some of the tribes that are now in Oklahoma were shipped out there on the train uh, for a couple years there. Uh, some eventually died there. I think there was even a couple women locked up there with them. But uh, the soldiers start giving them used uh, ledger paper from the government or, or blank paper, crayons, colored pencils, ink. And then the warriors uh, start drawing the lives that they couldn't live no more. Um, they were uh, drawing battle scenes, courting scenes, uh, their dreams, what they were used to living on a lot of the ledger paper that's considered uh, Fort Marion ledger art. So that was a, a period of ledger art. And uh, ledger art is over 100 years old, and there are several periods. And the period we're in now is contemporary ledger art, where men and women do it now. And several tribes do it besides Plains tribes. So um, kind of got its start there. And then it continued on. Another period is the reservation period, where Indian agents were encouraged warriors such as Sitting Bull to draw their lives on ledger paper. So that's why Sitting Bull has a few ledgers out there. So you're mostly known for your ledger art. What was the inspiration behind some designs in your ledger art and where did the love for it begin? I see a lot of it is stemming from uh, my tribe, which is Blackfeet, also known as Pacani here in Montana, inspired by our, our designs that we use in ceremony and our, our, our even our older designs that are passed down to like um, our teepee designs, our, our parflesh designs, our winter counts. And then growing up in a family of artists, I had a passion for um, pictographic style art and ledger art all my life. Your art takes many different forms too. You recently had a collaboration with Eighth Generation and you released um, some earrings. Can you talk about that? It's been an amazing journey with eight generations. So um, I'm an artist collaborate, collaborator with them. I, re I represent the Plains region. I've been with them since 2018, and we just released uh, a line of metal earrings because we started out doing wood earrings, and then they kind of like faded out. Then we did uh, acrylic earrings, and so 
we let them kind of fade out an hour into metal errands. I'm part of a, a inspired native project, which, which was uh, started by Louis Gong, who was the founder of A Generation. It's been a program, like an entrepreneurship program. So they gave me the tools to start my own business. So with A Generation, I started my own business, uh, more of a e-commerce business. So I have all these products, especially my original art, and I ship directly from my home to my customers. So the people that are buying on my website are, are buying from me directly. And so, yes, I released uh, a few blankets with them and uh, socks, earrings, uh, notebooks, and I'm getting re ready to release another blanket and some more towels and some more more stuff for the holidays with them. You've done some murals as well, some of which have been at schools. Um, what would you say to youth who are interested in art and the importance of art in schools? I think that art saves lives, especially if you feel hopeless as a youth and nowhere to turn. And I feel art is therapy. Sometimes I've witnessed students that came in and said they didn't like art or wanted to participate. It took them a few few days or a few weeks and then you couldn't stop them and are great artists themselves. I believe everybody are artists. And then I think it's up to you if you want to choose to create art because, like I said, it's, it's in all of us, especially as uh, Indigenous people, we are creative, whether we're singing, dancing, beating, writing. And nowadays with technology, we can do all kinds of art or media, even writing. And earlier this year, you gave some lectures at Yale University. Can you tell us about that experience? It was a great experience. I was invited out actually by a, a non-Indigenous student who happened to take be part of their Indigenous Studies program and found me on Instagram. And then we worked out all these opportunities and ideas. So I went out to Yale and gave some lectures to students and visited a few places, but also visited the Yale, um, the Yale Peabody collection of items from my tribe and, and, and building a relationship with the museum. And also looked at a, um, the Beinecke collection, um, went to the Beinecke library where there's numerous thousands of items and things from around the world it's one of the world's biggest collections of all kinds of history and books so they have a lot of native american even original ledger art in there so i research a lot of original ledger art um some of it from fort marion some of it from carlisle some some of some of the kiowa five and a lot of uh, uh stuff from my community and it was a blessing because me uh, coming from my community here in montana and reading about the stuff they had and knowing about the stuff they had and actually seeing in person was a blessing. Yeah, what was it like to see some of those pieces? It was awesome and and, and it was great because I I uh, I know for a fact that some of the stuff they had of ours hasn't been touched or seen by a person in our community in years. So uh, everything has a collective spirit. So with that, uh, it was great handling and, and I just reminded reminded our ancestors that, that we are still here and that someday they will come home. How do you approach your ledger art? Uh, as most artists, I can't work uh, uh, in a negative space or around negative energy, so I have to have a clear mind and, and good thoughts. And, and uh, so I usually start out with ideas and I have so many ideas running through my head since I was a kid. Um, so I just got to be inspired. Lately, I'm inspired by birds. I love birds. Um, so I usually get a piece of paper. I don't choose the writing or the date. I just choose the size and how it looks, the texture. Like uh, if it's a uh, kind of like older, um, older, more grayer. If it's more lighter, depends. And I, I I draw right on the ledger paper. I sketch right on it. Erase my marks. Add the ink and then the details. And uh, so every piece is just chosen at the moment of time because I have different pieces of paper laying around sometimes I just dig through it and find one that just appeals to me at the moment and how can people see your art in the meantime or get one of your pieces I have a website which is just my name John Isaiah Pepion and they could find my social media through there I post a lot on Instagram daily um, sometimes on my Facebook I even have a Facebook art page but you can find a lot about what I'm doing on my um, website and has all the products I have on there I try to keep updated with my originals and then I share what I can, even with my shows or where I'm showing um, on Instagram. John Fabian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Award-winning poet Kinsale Drake has spread her love of writing and literature through her organization called the Indian Girls Book Club, which has been featured in Teen Vogue. I interviewed Kinsale here in our studio, where she gave us a performance of her poem titled, Put That on KTNN. Take a look. Put on that KTNN. My mother was raised on Patsy Cline and Hank Williams' country that bounced in on her father's radio. Even today, I know I am nearing home when the pop music crackles into KTNN, licks of fluent Navajo flitting between Loretta Lynn and Johnny Cash. They are interludes, too, for drum beats and throaty covers of well-loved tunes put on by some local boy's gas station banjo and hot rocket guitar, a strong woman that sings the seasons over a hand drum. Then it is back to more Loretta Lynn. All contradictions find a home in the body. The insect skin of the car sluicing the Arizona desert as the cicadas pick up their grand instruments. How else to know you enter a land of monuments, not a wasteland, loved by radio waves and peach trees and small silly dogs that bridge the distance between a chapter house and the nearest sonics in a city. The moon rocks darken into pine, pine into slick rock, and the whole world remembers what it once was. Grand ocean, sun, plankton, pearl, blood, ancestor, cloud. Radio rainbows the most violent parts of the land, thrashed by thunderstorm and sea, as the rattles pick up their backing track and Hank Williams rolls in all over again, easy and easy and blue. That was so beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We're very excited that you're here and welcome back to the ICT Newscast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I want to actually dive into the poem that you just read. Sure. So tell us how it first started for you. Well, my earliest memories are of music. I'm sure for many of us they are. And I grew up with the soundtrack of my family, which largely was country music from my mom's side, big urban cowboy girl. She loved uh, the Eagles. And from my dad's side, it was a lot of Motown that he was into when he was younger. And so this backing track I had to my life had a great cultural relevance that was shared, I found, by other young Native people, especially Navajos. And so that, that kind of common language that we have that musical landscape is something that I wanted to explore in a poem where you're kind of moving through Arizona and hearing this music. And I know that so many Navajo viewers will know KTNN, yeah. <laughs> but for folks who maybe don't know what it is, tell us about it. Yeah, it's the Navajo music radio station. And way back in the day, it was like the only radio station that would come on the res. And that's what my mom recalls listening to growing up. And that's what her, her dad would play in his truck. And um, that's what we play when we come back home. I love that. <laughs> um, I want to talk and say congratulations to you because you've recently been named a winner of the 2023 National Poetry Series competition. Thank you. How, how did you feel when you got that news? Um, <laughs> like, I was going to pass out. It was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely overwhelming. Um, I've admired all the winners of that series ever since Jake Skeets won, and um, he's also a Diné poet. And that's when I really started paying attention to the series because I knew that, you know, Navajos could win it. And I just submitted my, my thesis project from university, thinking not much of it. I just thought I'd put myself out there. And I ended up winning. And I, I believe I'm one of the youngest winners. So, of course, that was a huge thing to think about, how it must be really cool for younger people to see me win and get excited about young Native poets. And, um, of course, Jake is excited. And Hyde Erdrich, who also had won a couple years back, she also was very excited. The last time that we visited with you, you were actually here in Phoenix to launch the Indian Girls Book Club. Um, yeah. Tell us about that initiative and organization. So Indian Girls Book Club is a literary organization that was also part of my project in college to um, keep Native students in higher education. So we have some of the lowest retainment rates in the nation, and that's because a lot of times Native students are being pushed, pushed out of um, higher institutions of learning. I know you went to Stanford, and so you understand. Um, but especially in the creative writing space, there's so little support for Native students unless you go to a place like IAIA. And so I was thinking of how to create programs that could sustainably support and mentor students. And so that's how Indian Girls Book Club came about. But it's really just all the things I love, like pink and glitter and making books really fun to read and bringing people together. And this love for community that I've had throughout my career as a writer, it's all 
all kind of packaged into one thing. So we do workshops, readings, author talks, things like that for free. And what has been the reaction from people who participate? Oh, it's been lovely. It's been very much a healing journey, I think, for my inner child and also I think a lot of people's inner, ch inner children. I think um, I've gotten a lot of messages from older Native women in particular, and they just will say, you know, I wish I had this when I was a little girl. And it just feels good knowing that that little girl is still in us and it's nourishing some part of us that wanted to read, you know, books with people who looked like us when we were kids. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about other Indigenous poets. One that's coming to mind, I'm sure a lot of people know, is Joy Harjo. Yes. Um, maybe talk about her and if she's been an inspiration in your own life. Joy Harjo is definitely an inspiration. I've met her a few times at this point, and for a number of reasons, she's a trailblazer, but I love how original she is. I love how she plays saxophone on stage. I love that she does her own thing and doesn't take you know, anything from anybody. Um, but you know, she's breaking ground as the first US poet laureate of the United States who is indigenous that we know of. And to see her work represented on these beautiful historic stages is just something, there's something so unsettling in the best way about it. Like there's a voice in there that has never been in there before in a positive light and that you just know a lot of change is coming. I know that you interact with a lot of young children, especially like in grade school, elementary school, middle school. Do you ever have to convince them to like poetry or what is <laughs> what are those conversations like with the young people? Sometimes they're a little doubtful, but I understand. I didn't like poetry at one point, but I usually have a nice entrance, which is music. And Tupac, I'll talk to them and say, Tupac was a poet before he was a rapper. You guys know him? And they'll be like, yeah. So sometimes that'll get their attention, but poetry is all around us, and I think it influences us in pop culture much more than we think it does. Absolutely. I want to know what you're listening to right now or what you're reading right now in terms of poetry. Yeah, so poetry, I listen to The Slowdown with Major Jackson. I was just a guest on that show, and it's a poetry podcast that pairs music and um, important conversations recently about environmentalism with some poems by... Uh, poets across the country. Um, I've been reading some spooky season books, which are great, great reads right now. So there's the new anthology, Never Whistle at Night, which is an indigenous dark fiction anthology that's edited by Shane Hawk. And I've been loving the cover art for that. The, um, the other one is Louise Erdrich's um, book, The Roundhouse, which is a scary read, but very necessary to understanding the violences that impact Native women contemporarily. And then finally, My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. It's a slasher novel with a native emo protagonist, and it really doesn't get any better than that. So I'm not going to spoil too much of that one, but that's a favorite of mine. You've had such a bright career so far. So I have to ask you, what's next for you? I have my first book coming out. That's kind of what I'm focused on. Um, it's just a dream come true, and I'm so excited that you know I get to share these poems and meet with young Native writers and be able to mentor them. And I hopefully will get to teach eventually. I'm, I'm still going to be going to grad school in the next two years or so and hopefully be a mentor for Native students in the future. I know that a lot of our viewers will want to um, you know, stay connected with you. So tell us very quickly where people can find you. Yeah, you can find me at Kinsale Hughes on Instagram. And you can also find Indian Girls Book Club there. So that's just the same as the name at Indian Girls Book Club. Well, I've loved this conversation. That poem was so beautiful. Uh, yet again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on to more spoken word, this year marks the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Indigenous rappers Moo Moo Fresh and Tall Paul reflect on their own start and how they and other Native artists have been impacted by the music. ICT's Vincent Moniz has the story. I am the daughter of freedom fighters and farmers, bootleggers and number runners, copper color skin like clay, cooler than Indian summers, blooded by oracles and seers, water porters and healers, once were warriors, now killers and drug dealers. Mississippi, Choctaw and Creek, but raised in Baltimore, so my vernacular from the streets, we move carefully. My pack of wolves, they care for me prayerfully, you'll only lose a limb fooling with them. I am the product of a gypsy and a kingpin. I exist somewhere between Egypt and Sing Sing. Born to be a revolutionary since a wee thing. Rebellion in the memory of the memories I was drinking. I am the product of prayers and potions and heartbreak and devotion. I come from gorgeous women who cut and shoot and don't say sorry later. Short-tempered, easily provoked, 
They possess spirits, conjure worlds, see the future, clutch their pearls, stay hella woke. Enchantment, birth and raise babies, yep, lots of them. In its 50 year span, rap has moved from a passing fad to a foundational culture that touches all parts of the world. Using the art form as a reflection of the issues and troubles of their lives, the music and rhyme sayers do not pull punches. In the beginning, the messages and stories were met with fear or disrespect by mainstream culture. Mississippi Choctaw Nation descendant Mumu Fresh got her start just wanting to beat her older brother in a rap battle in front of the Baltimore, Maryland Indian Center. I really got into rapping, trying to keep up with my older brother. He was a really good, he is a really good freestyle rapper. And we, we grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. You know, we went to the, to the Baltimore Indian Center, City Indians. And I would, um, he would sit out on the front step with his friends and he would tell me and my sister that we couldn't come on the front steps when his friends were there. And they would sit outside and, you know, rap together. And I, I would sit in the window and I wanted to come outside partially because we didn't have central air, you know, so it would, it would be really hot inside in the summertime. And I wanted to, to sit outside where it would be a little cooler and I wanted to listen to them rap. So I would come outside and he would say, if I came outside, he would then start battling me. And, you know, calling me names and just, you know, saying, and it would, everyone would laugh because it was so good. He was so just genius about the way he could just tear your self-esteem apart. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's laughable now, but it, it, even then I didn't like take it personally. I just thought to myself, I have to get better. You know, I would, I would get chased back in the house and I would start writing down raps and I would say, I'm going to get to sit outside one day. And so I would just go back in the house and I would write down raps, all the things, you know, criticism about his teeth and, you know, his forehead and everything I could think about, you know. Those I've wronged and who have wronged me, gotta treat them like family. Get your money, do we do cow with shin, Jamushka Wizzy Gan, me dust for me, it dizzy gan, me shit shanam, za get away when your new shit shanam, this and down with shanam, me wang your nugga mo yan, me show me sweet do cow with shanam, jet I budget two yang, a nishanabe is your twa, me jet bit, get came to mind, k guy, nishanabe, but my dizzy win. One of the things that separates native hip hop is the inclusion of indigenous melodies and languages. Prayer is in a song, written by Leech Lake Ojibwe citizen Tall Paul, features the hip hop artist rapping to the beat in his language. Paul, who was raised in South Minneapolis, Minnesota, knows that it takes a lot of work to find success. The rapper, who continues to tour and make new music, talks about his hopes for the future of indigenous people in hip hop. Um, you know, I just hope that we continue to express ourselves in a way that's true to ourselves as artists, you know, and, um, you know, whether it's as natives or from our own personal experiences, you know, I feel like I'm a mixed bag between making sure I speak on things that are relevant to our people. But, you know, it's a natural thing because it also relates to me. I just write and rap about everything that's naturally close to my heart and on my mind. And, you know, it's this natural process of um, packaging myself within my native culture and putting it into this avenue of hip hop. And it goes out into the world and it's, you know, an expression of myself and who I am in that time. And I just hope that, you know, us artists, us native artists continue to express ourselves in ways that are true to ourselves, you know, regardless of how close we grew up into the culture or around our people and not, you know, um, I hope we just keep on, you know, diversifying our skills and talents within this genre and that we grow with the culture and, and uh, you know, expand just like it, ha it has done. And, you know, I hope that, you know, the visibility continues to increase and that more and more of us are able to get platformed and get opportunities based on, you know, this, this gift to us that is hip hop. Anything is possible. You know, there was a time when the response to hip hop was like, turn that noise off. <laughs> and if you have a belief about something in your heart that you feel driven to do and to push, like don't give up on it. Even if no one believes in it, if it's, even if it's just you, if everyone says like, this will never work, this is stupid. But if you feel strongly about it, keep pushing it. Cause even if you don't get to experience the benefits of it, you could open the door for someone else to be able to experience the benefits of it and, and be a, you know, a forerunner and a, 
trailblazer. I think about that to, when I think about 50 years of hip hop that no one thought it would make it, you know, like Biggie said, they never thought hip hop would take it this far. It's so true. And it it should stand as a testament that anything that you can think of, if you can visualize it, you can bring it into reality. And at first people, first they laugh and then they join in. Then they say, how can I join? Mumu Fresh and Tall Paul both acknowledge that though it is a tough road, the next generation of native hip hop will find the way to the top. In Bismarck, North Dakota, Vincent Moniz, ICT News. We invite you to remember that around the world, Indigenous people are celebrated. In Canada, Indigenous Peoples Day is always marked by the summer solstice, while August 9th is Global Indigenous Peoples Day. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.